you Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party This the people party What's up, party people in the place to be? This is the BKMC, the MCEO, Talib Kweli, and you are watching the world's best podcast, People's Party. How you doing? I'm live in Los Angeles right now. And recently, I had the pleasure of performing and participating in a Grammy celebration of hip-hop, particularly 90s hip-hop, particularly the 90s type of hip-hop that I grew up listening to. And I felt honored and blessed to be on that stage because a lot of those groups on stage with me, I wasn't even outside when they was outside. I was inside watching Video Music Box, watching BET, watching Rap City, watching MTV, Yo! MTV Raps and all that. So I felt really privileged to be on stage with some of my heroes and people I grew up on. And today's group is one of the groups that was most influential on me as an artist. This group blew up and became uh, a very, very, very influential group in the early 90s. This group had a lot of success, but no matter how successful they got, they never let go of the consciousness. They never let go of the spirituality. They never let go of the connection to Africa. As a matter of fact, I would argue that they even leaned more into it the more successful they became. And that became very inspirational for artists like myself who wanted to still party and dance and have big records, but still have that consciousness and that culture. Now, we're talking about a group whose debut album, three years, five months, two days in the life of, broke in the scene like a comet. They lit up the sky with they hit single Tennessee. They won two Grammys that year. They kept the momentum going with people every day. They kept the momentum going with Zinga yes. Lama Dooney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't get yeah. to say that album's title yeah. out loud yeah. very often. Um, but also Amongst the Trees, yeah. Um, yeah. This Was Never Home. Yeah. Craft and Optics, yep. which is an amazing record. Thank you. They have never stopped touring. They have never stopped taking their message all over the world. So without further ado, we're going to give our flowers and we're going to show love to these visionaries, these trailblazers, one of the embodiments of a revolutionary sound, and they keep it hip hop, the voice of the voiceless. We got Farida Alim in the house. We got Masho Ishii in Ishi, the house. Yes. Masho Ishii in the house. <laughs> and of course, we got the legendary speech from the legendary Arrested Development. Yes, indeed. Yay, thank, thank, thank you so much. That is the dopest Beautiful intro. intro. Thank Amazing. you. Let's take it back to the beginning. Okay. To Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah. Home of the Fonz. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Fonzarelli, Laverne and Shirley. That's right. Let's talk about the Fox Trap Club. Come on, bro. So, yeah. So, from Milwaukee, my dad's a serial entrepreneur. And... Um, you know, one of his many uh, entrepreneurial things was starting a nightclub. He used to call it um, Rich Man, Poor Man, and then he changed it to Fox Trap. Fox Trap was one of the most, like, banging nightclubs for black people in Milwaukee. You know what I'm saying? And Milwaukee's actually very black. A lot of people don't know that. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So um, it was it's just very influential nightclub, and I grew up in that nightclub. So, like, for me... After school, I would go there, you know, just go after school, hang out backstage, actually pick through records. And, you know, he would actually put me in charge of deciding what the DJ should play. So I would listen to records all night, you know, all night and all day and just decide what to play. Yeah. So that was a foxtrap. <laughs> Dope place. DJing that early influenced you as a musician? The foxtrap period influenced me to become a DJ. Mm. I would see DJs spinning... Shout out to Kenny B, for instance, uh, Reg UJ. Um, these brothers would spin, and I would see the impact that it had on the people. Mm -hmm. And I realized, like, that's the magician. That's the person that's wielding the emotions, the mood. He's changing the entire atmosphere by what he's playing, and I wanted to be that. So um, Kenny B taught me how to DJ, and that was before the hip-hop style DJ, and that was just like the fading, the slow fade mm -hmm. into a slow fade, you know, um, and not even on beat. And he, he taught me how to do that. And that was my beginnings of just, to be honest, the beginnings of who I am now. No doubt. Yeah. Um, shout out to the Milwaukee Community Journal. Come on, shout out, my mother. <laughs> the oldest black newspaper in Milwaukee. And the largest. And the largest. And yeah. your mother runs it. My mother runs and owns that. Yeah, black And you woman. and I share the fact that our parents are educators. I know your Facts. mother used to be a yep, teacher. Yep, my mother well. used to be a teacher, elementary school teacher. And, um, 
that alone, I mean, just was so impactful. My mother, back during uh, the assassination of Martin, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., mm -hmm. there was a riot, you know what I'm saying, that happened in Milwaukee, across the nation as well. And during that time, a lot of the businesses were looted, burned down, stuff like this. When it was time for them to open back up, they tapped my mother on the shoulder as an educator and said, we need something to inform the community that we're back open. And the major newspaper in Milwaukee at that time, uh, what's it called? The Milwaukee, what's it called? I forget. Anyway, the main newspaper at that time, if you can imagine back in 68, was not willing to talk about these businesses. Mm -hmm. And so they tapped her on the shoulder and she put together a pamphlet called The Soul City Shopper. And that turned into the Milwaukee Community Journal over time. That became the largest, and still is, the largest black newspaper. I think it's 45 years now that okay. they've been going strong with that. Yeah. Now, is it also true that your group that you started, Attack, um, yeah. was one of the first major groups from Facts. Milwaukee, right? So in Milwaukee, we were one of the first hip-hop groups to ever put on wax Okay. in Milwaukee. Um, we were probably the most popular group at that time. And it was me, a brother named Special K, uh, which is now DJ Kimmett. Shout out to DJ Kimmett. <laughs> DJ Kimmett in Atlanta, you know, worldwide. Um, and my man T.A. Wiz, rest in peace to T.A. Wiz. And um, so it was us three. Mm -hmm. And we was basically an influence from like, I'd say UTFO to mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little bit of like Run DMC, you know, mm -hmm. that type of energy, yeah. Yeah. Aisha, you said you were born yes. and raised in Atlanta. Yes. Yep. Right? And, you know, Little John was also a DJ in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. He was, mm -hmm. from what I understand, he was DJing reggae clubs and all different types of music Facts. before he was a, an innovator in the sort of crunk sound. Facts. But when I used to visit Atlanta back in the day, my man Rubik, shout out to my man Rubik, he moved down there early. There was something going on, yeah. you know, like like pre Dungeon Family. Yes. Um, with like you know when you had like, I don't know what it was. It's like this suit, this like red clay black energy. It's like when Moshu moved down. That was a Brooklyn yeah. company, yeah. but I remember uh -huh. when they yes. moved down to Atlanta. Yeah, I remember that too. Um, yeah. You know, I spoke to Killer Mike about. He gave me the history of like the Atlanta airport and how mm -hmm. a lot of black people got hired. Yeah, facts. at the airport and just sort of like black excellence and black independence in yeah. Atlanta. Yes. And, you know, Atlanta has its fair share of problems, but Facts. in a lot of ways, it's like the closest thing to Wakanda that we have. <laughs> yeah, totally. No, that's very, very true. You know totally, yeah, yeah. yes. What yes. do you think it is about Atlanta that makes it unique like that? Well, you know, Atlanta is so many um, thriving, amazing African-Americans there, as mm -hmm. you were saying. Like, it's just like the Wakanda, right? Right. Um, and I mean, just growing up um, from Atlanta, I'm from the SWAT Zone mm -hmm. 4. <laughs> Okay. My mom was one of the first black-owned dance schools in the state of Georgia. It was called okay. the Gaither School of Dance. Yeah. And so um, the arts movement was very strong in Atlanta. Um, like, I grew up with CeeLo and Sleepy mm -hmm. Brown and all yep. of them. You know, we went to school together. Yep. So it was always just... Um, uh, energy, edu education was top tier, but the arts also, you know, because back then we didn't have phones, cell phones, internet, mm -hmm. and all that. You had to get in the streets, and that's how we vibed and connected. We would go to Jelly Bean Skate Rink and, mm -hmm. you know, go to all kinds of art events in Atlanta. And it's just, the city's just special. The, the food, the the whole energy, you know, we have so much rich rich history there. Benjamin E. Mays and Dr. Martin Luther King, all these people lived in the West End, you yeah, know what I mean? Fact, yeah. And it's just, it's always been that. You know, yes. it feels just, um, it's a historical place and it's a place where um, black people come and they're like, wow, I've never seen so many black people doing well. Right, <laughs> no, that's true. Right. Very true. And it's just Very a beautiful true. place, you know. You know, Atlanta also is a place of opportunity for a lot of black people. Like, for me, I came from Milwaukee to Atlanta because it showed that black people could succeed, black people could move up in the ranks of the world and you saw examples of it. Representation was very full, you know what I'm saying? And in a lot of different diverse areas, you saw it. So yeah. it was just, I, I think there was this mixture of intellectual, you know, pride in, in, in intellect, but pride in culture, pride in Africa, pride in civil rights, pride, in, like there was this, in spirituality. So it was all of these things that was coinciding at the same time. And from an artistic uh, standpoint, 
there was a lot of movements as well, a lot of rock groups, black rock groups doing stuff down there because to express yourself was celebrated. You know what I mean? So it was like to be as diverse as we possibly could be. And to be And be authentic <laughs> and be as yeah. renaissance as we possibly could be as yeah. a people. That was yeah. something that was appreciated. Mm -hmm. And that, that was, so. it was very attractive. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you mentioned your mother was a dance teacher. Yes. And on stage, while we were rehearsing, you know, Arrested Development, there's always been a dance element on right. stage. Mm -hmm. yeah. African dance element. Yes. Yeah. Mother yes. was teaching African dance. Yes. And it's been a very sort of powerful part of your show. Thanks. I've noticed when I noticed when the dancers, when you when y'all were performing, um, people every day, the dancers who were hired, shout out to Fatima Robinson, yes. yeah. they awesome. were like, I could hear them responding to y'all dancing. Yes. Like, Word up. Yeah. Ah, because I, I don't think they even expected to see rappers or like yeah. underground rappers or 90s rappers having yeah. that sort of dance element. Yeah. So why for everybody, why was it so important so early in the group and, and all the way to now to incorporate that dancing, particularly African dance? Um, for me, like, so I've been dancing since I was two. I'm trained in ballet, jazz, mm -hmm. tap, point, all kinds of stuff. And, you know, I was always taught as a as a, a young, young, young dancer, give 150%, whatever mm -hmm. you do. So growing up, I just love dance. And, like, it's really a part of me. It actually is my, my, um, my freedom. Mm -hmm. That's why I feel the most yeah. free, right? And so... Uh, I started like really heavily getting into African dance when I was in the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. The first dance I learned was Funga Alafia Oshe Oshe. That was my favorite first dance, mm -hmm. right? And so from there, I just started just incorporating the ballet, the jazz, the hip hop, everything into it. But it's so important because I think when I met Speech, I was 13 years old when mm -hmm. I auditioned for Speech and Headliner. And I just came in being 13, myself. Right. I was 13. Yeah, right. yeah, and I just came in being myself. And African dance was just part of something I did. They wanted someone who specifically did African dance. Yeah. But I just naturally mm -hmm. was something I did. It's so important because it's just, you know, authenticity is very important in being in this group, you know, and being your authentic self. So that's just part of who I yeah. am. <laughs> that's beautiful. And yeah. To her point, as a young girl growing up, when I was watching the band, I gravitated toward Ishii. Mm -hmm. I, Me for the oh, sex appeal, I Ishii him, for the band. I saw him all the time. Oh, Ishii was the rest of development to me. Oh. Yeah. And so a lot of dancers, including the ones that you saw, would attribute their understanding that you could actually make a living and do something with your life through dance. Yes. Because we saw representation. Mm -hmm. I, I was growing up watching MTV, VH1, you know, we, as a kid, you know, I, I was born in LA, but I was raised in Atlanta. And I went back and forth a lot because my mom was one of the first black women to have a limousine company okay. in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Did y'all take limousines back and forth? From the <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Literally everywhere. And yeah. it was weird because Driving up in the 80s mm -hmm. in a limousine yeah. to like McDonald's. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, right, yeah. like, right out there. And, go, yeah. and my mom, she kind of looks like Shaka Khan. So yeah, they, they would just kind of think that yeah. that was what was going on. Yeah. But I love it. to that point, like yeah. growing up, and we were always around music. My mom was driving all the SOS band. Like she was always around, you know, Muhammad Johnny Ali. Taylor, Muhammad Ali. We were, were yeah. babysat by yeah. his daughters. Yeah. Yeah. And so we were always around the arts and then obviously entrepreneur, black entrepreneurship. Yeah. But we went back and forth to, to here from Atlanta to L.A. a lot. And so my experience with the arts was through watching videos. Yeah. Yeah. And the first time I saw this gorgeous black girl on TV, Ball head, just mm -hmm. unapologetically, <laughs> unapologetically black and yeah. dancing African dance. I had the same experience. That was never anything we could see on yeah. TV, right? So it's we were real. like, my mind was blown. I was yeah. like, what yeah. is this? And but so that's what we know, were doing. It's, I appreciate that. That's so sweet. <laughs> Being from Atlanta, though, it was really hard because like Atlanta wasn't on it. You yeah, know they on saying? a different type of dance. <laughs> no, Atlanta. Yeah. No. We was doing the yeah. we yeah. were yinking we back then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, yeah. and ATL yeah. bass, oh, yeah. and oh, it was all really. about the stuff I wasn't supposed yeah. to be doing in school yeah. that yeah. we was doing in eighth grade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Atlanta. Yes. Yeah. Can, I, yeah. can, I, can I piggyback yes. off of that? I want to say that like in the very beginnings, for me, I wanted to have a group that had African dancers. And when Headliner and I first was doing gigs in Atlanta, it was almost like Soul to Soul. 
where mm-hmm. Jazzy B sort of was the hub, right? Right. And he had people like a Karen Wheeler mm-hmm. and whoever, and like all around him, right? We was doing that early on where we would have African dancers, we would have um, African drummers, we would have live paint, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying, during our mm-hmm. show. And all of that stuff was happening. We at first auditioned, uh, my <laughs> man Ian Burke brought your sister, Young Kita. So he told my sister, I have an older sister. She was mm-hmm. dancing with like Pebbles and everybody at that time. Okay. And she was like, Pebbles she, was huge in the world. Right. Yeah, exactly. Pebbles she was, was like, nah, my big sister stuff. should do yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so Ian and my sister took me to the audition. I remember what I had on. When they saw what I had on, yeah. though. She looked like Kwame. <laughs> so she had, she had polka dots. hair at the time. I had polka dots. She had polka dots all over the place. And I'm like, <laughs> hammer pants and I don't think this shit? is it. Like, this is right. not what I'm imagining. <laughs> this is it. And, um, <laughs> And then, then, but no, quickly, well, Headliner actually said, yeah. yo, she's going to work. He saw, he saw the, the Africanness in you, because to me, the way you were dressed at the time just threw me off. It just was like, I don't think this is going to work. This is not what we're trying to do. I was a big Kwame fan. I, I love am. Kwame. I love, I love Shout Kwame. Shout out to Kwame. No, Kwame is like major, but I'm just saying, it just wasn't the vibe we were going for. Yeah. But yeah. then, of course, I mean, Headliner was 100% right. Like, the way, the way you became who you are. Yes. It just thank was you. such a such a great representation of black strength and and womanhood and just it was amazing. Yeah, so and it yeah. was a big age gap too at that time too. I was in the eighth grade. No, in facts, college. yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now speaking of college, like you were in University of Wisconsin, right? Yeah. And UWM. then you went to arts Institute in Atlanta, that's where you mm-hmm. met Headliner, right? That's where mm-hmm. I met Headliner, yeah. And so, shout out to Headliner. Yep, yes. shout out to um, Headliner. Uh, DJ Headliner. DJ. For, for me, Arrested, what you just said was very thoughtful just now. Very deliberate. Very, very uh, much so. Very academic, very yeah. intellectual. Yeah. And I think Arrested Development, part of the draw for me that is unapologetically yeah. this type of group. Yeah, exactly. Is it safe to say that this was a response to how big gangster rap was at the time? I think it's safe to say that it was. Mm -hmm. And also, it was safe to say that I knew that we needed to have more representation than what was presently being presented of us Mm -hmm. as a people. We needed to have that other side, that that other side of the community where in Atlanta, for instance, you go to West End and there is indeed African drummers. There is indeed Mm -hmm. people that's talking about natural hair and talking about natural remedies and natural food and... That is a real thing, you know what I'm saying? And that wasn't being represented very well to me in hip-hop at the time. And so it needed to be represented. It was what we were about in the first place. And um, like you said, very intentional, Mm -hmm. you know, which I believe in. I believe in intentionality. intentionality, I think also, too, I felt like, you know, with Baba OJ and then Airely, everybody, different different people, Razadine, it just represented like, it looked like a family. So it's like, yeah. that's my cousin, that's my uncle, mm-hmm. that's my son, you know what I mean? So it very much so had that energy. And when Facts. we would go places and do shows, that's what people would say. You remind yeah. me of my cousin or this. And exactly. So. Yeah. And that's part of what I feel like the, the strong presence of the group is that there's a hodgepodge of different, everybody's coming with their own special sauce. sauce. <laughs> everybody's coming very Stop. authentically themselves yeah. and no one's trying to be any like anyone else so it's yeah. a lot of synergy mm-hmm. yeah but no one's you know you're not you know speech encourages authenticity it encourages Fast. you to just come on as you are and just give the best version of yourself and then that's what gels together to make arrested development its best version of itself no matter who's mm-hmm. on stage it's a great stew <laughs> um, shout out to Rasa Don. Yes. Shout out to Raz. And um, you know, rest in peace to Baba OJ. Yes. Yeah, thank of you. Of course. Thank um, you. Yes. For me, as someone who comes from that same tradition, yeah. you know, my parents were taking me to the African street festivals and yeah. we were going mm-hmm. to Dance Africa and yeah. going to these things. It was very important in the community I came from to support your elders, to That's uplift right. your elders, to, to build with the elders mm-hmm. and have them involved. Facts. I don't know if anyone did that in hip-hop before y'all. Yeah. 
you know? I, I don't I don't think so, not to that extent. You know, we all we have a song called Bob OJ as the oldest one. <laughs> That's a great song. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. And then, you know, and, to, and you have I like the fact that you have that song twice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's we like do. The lyrics part one, the, part two. And then the, just the the, the 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 sort of celebratory chant. Exactly, yes. yeah. We and, love to see and the way the Baba gets down. Whether you know who Baba OJ is, you know, Baba's like African word yeah. um, for father or yes. grandfather, right? Yep, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, depending on how you use it. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, you know, I called my grandfather Baba word up. growing up. Mm -hmm. And so for anyone who knows that, that song applies to anyone who has elders in their life. Facts. Yes. That's, That's right. beautiful That's about right. the song. Yes. Yeah, and Baba was... 87 when he passed. Mm -hmm. He was 47 or 57 when we met him. 57. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Baba was from Mississippi. His real name is just O.J. Johnson, which is an interesting <laughs> tradition, right, in the South, mm -hmm. where you name your first child O.J. Like, it, it don't yeah. stand for nothing. It's just O.J. Right. You know? yeah. And so, like, O.J. Johnson and Baba, he took on that because, and this is all, this is all sort of the, the crazy synergy of Arrested Development, one example of it. When my mother, okay, so I asked Bob OJ to be in the group. I met him at UWM, which you just mentioned, you know, uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And I wanted an elder in the group because I just thought it would be crazy dope. I thought that the age gap thing was too emphasized in America. And I felt like in Jamaica, for instance, there was this, there was this thing where a lot of the young people was rocking the older acts and loved it, you know, having a good time. So I was like, yo, we need to have that into this group. And... At first he said no. Then he found out <laughs> he um, when I asked him to be in a crew. Because it's, I mean, imagine a 57-year-old dude right. getting asked to be in a hip-hop group back right. in the, you know what I'm saying, in the, in the, in the 80s. With these kids, nobody. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so he's I like... Hear, I hear about it right now. What do you know about it? What do you know about it? Exactly. You don't know nothing about music in the first place. So, so, um, and so I asked him, he said no. Then he, he found out I was a Thomas kid. That's my last name. And it turns out that Baba was the best man in my mother and father's wedding before I was even conceived or thought of. <laughs> wow. I did not know that. I had crazy. no idea about that. Yeah. So that's the crazy synergy about Baba OJ. And he started to study Africa. My mother and father went to Africa when I was two. They went to Kenya. I have relatives there. And they came back. He stayed. Okay. He started traveling all throughout Africa. Yeah. And stayed at my uh, my uncle's house basically for years, which this is Baba's tradition. <laughs> Anywhere he would go, he would end up staying if he wanted to okay. stay, and he'd stay for years. Okay, He's just wherever he laid that hat, wherever he lays the hat, it's his yeah. home. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Rolling Stone. Yeah. And so he did that throughout. Hey man, Africa. you don't collect no more that way. Exactly right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so Baba was one of those kind of dudes, and um, he became a part of the Osar Set Society, mm -hmm. and they have strict like African traditions that they follow. Mm -hmm. So he was teaching us a lot of that. So like this is this is early yeah. Baba. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. We were in uh, in Kiru books, which I still have in Kiru books, we were selling all those Asara Set Society books. Exactly yeah. right. So you know exactly I know exactly what it is. Yeah. yeah man. Um I remember the first time I heard Tennessee. Yeah. It had to be video music box. Shout out to Ralph McDaniels. Shout out yes. to Ralph McDaniels. Yeah, yeah thank you. Box. It really yeah. blew me away. I never heard a sing-songy style that hit like that. Yeah. Um, the beat was still hard. Yeah. Thank it you. was still hip hop, but it was very melancholy. You're dealing yeah. with loss. Yeah. You know the origin story of that yeah. song is that you lost people in your life, Facts. a couple people at the same time, right? Yeah. Can you dive into that a little bit. Yeah. So first of all, thank you, thank you, and thank you because the song came about. It was the last song that we recorded for the first album. Mm -hmm. We had already finished the entire album, and shortly after we had finished, my grandmother, who I spent all my summers in Tennessee with, mm -hmm. she passed of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. I went down there with my family, my brother, my mother, father, and others, and, and celebrated her life. That same week, my brother died as well of an asthma attack. And at that point, I was lost, because... The realities of death is hard as it is, but the realities of death back to back, unexpected, not someone very old. My brother was 29 when he, when, he was, when he died of an asthma attack. And in the same week as my grandmother, it just felt like nothing's guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Nothing is, you know, nothing is definite. You know what I'm That's saying? That's right. And 
the feeling of loss was just all I could think of and the feeling of what's the purpose of life. So like, take me to another place, take me to another land, make me forget all that hurts me and help me understand your plan. Those, that song rolled off my, that whole song rolled off my tongue, like lyrically and even musically. Mm -hmm. I know you've been there, been here, where it's just like, it's almost just channeled through you, yeah. you know what I mean? And the fact that it was the last joint that we ever recorded for that album, but the first joint that we release, to me is just poetic, you know what I'm saying, for our entire yeah. trajectory from then on, you know? It's like that often, I think. You know, yeah. for me, definitely like The Blast was the last song we recorded. Actually, Jared is here right now. We, yeah. we turned in the album and he was like, you need a single. You right, know what I mean? right, exactly. <laughs> you have a single. We went yeah. back and recorded The Blast and that became like a big record. The big Get record, By yeah. as well was the last song we recorded Word for that up. record. Wow. Really? So that, that's how it goes, I think, sometimes. Wow. Wow. Now, on that album, you have this record, Rain and Revolution. Yeah. And again, like I, you know, I was in boarding school when this album came out, and it was it connected me to. I was one of six black kids at a school with 137 kids, Word and up. so it connected me to my community in a real way. Listening to Arrested yeah. Development music, but particularly Rain and Revolution. At that time, if y'all remember, in the early '90s, hip hop was still not taken seriously, no, and facts. so Rain and Revolution and that album, but that song in particular, yeah. is one I used to play for people. Because I was like an ambassador for hip-hop culture. Yeah. I'm like, yo, this is what hip-hop is capable of. Exactly this right. This is the yeah. potential of hip-hop. Yeah. You think hip-hop is just one thing. Have you heard this Rain and Revolution by exactly. Rick Development? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. thank you for making that record. I really appreciate that. Can I talk about that for a second? Please. Um, that's, why, that's why I brought it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yo, that record for me is very pivotal because that was the first time that I rhymed in melody. Okay. The whole song. Okay. So, you know, this is my recollection in hip-hop. I never knew a hip-hop record that rhymed in melody the whole track. So I remember things like Lottie Dottie or whatever, like, it's all because of you, or like... Right, or, and those melodies and are the, even taken from someplace else. And taken from someplace yeah. else. And then also, I mean, don't get me wrong, routines in hip-hop have always included melody, you know? That's right. And the bass was kicking, uh, you know, everybody would, like, put melody in at a certain point and then go back to... This was Raining Revolution... I tried it without melody, and it just, to me, the words didn't match the magnitude of what I was striving to say, and so I strived to put it in melody, and everything changed at that point. I felt like, yo, this is crazy. This is different, and that's what made me do Tennessee in melody with such a, a, heavy, a heavy moment as well. Raining Revolution was first, though, you know what I'm saying? And so that, that song will always be sort of like, for me, the, the beginnings of that type of style. You know I what I mean? I feel like I knew that without knowing it. Yeah. Because it was something that connected me to that song. Yeah. Absolutely. That's yeah. actually one of my favorite songs to perform live when we do it. Yeah. It, it actually brings a, a certain energy to the moment. To the, it's, a, it's a catalyst as mm -hmm. the show goes, from, goes through. It, it brings a sense of calm and connects, a connectivity yeah. when we're performing it. And yeah, that that song in particular is just a vibe. I want to say one more thing, if you if you're cool with it. Like, yes, absolutely. Um, we were striving to get a deal back then, and so I, we were sending a lot of the records that would end up being on Three Years album to various artists, labels. Now, mind you, we're in Atlanta, so we didn't we we weren't able to just walk down the street and go from label to label like a lot of right. You can do that in do. Atlanta now. Now Atlanta's you can. been the home of hip hop for quite yeah. some time. Yeah. True. Yeah. Back so then, back then it was not. Oh. So, you know, I sent it to Poss from Dayla. Was he in Atlanta at the time? No, he was in New York. And I knew him from a woman named Kat Jackson who knew him. So I I I knew her. She connected me to him, sent it to him. And I didn't know how much he hated Tommy Boy. I was trying to get on Tommy Boy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know at the time what, right. what would happen with that. So he was like, man, I love, and my point is, he loved that record. Like, that was the record that really connected him to what we was doing. And I always respected him for that. And he, he said, I'll do whatever I can. You know what I'm saying? That's beautiful. But yeah. This question is for everybody. Arrested Development, starting with, in my opinion, Fishing for Religion, mm -hmm. has taken us on a spiritual journey. Yeah. 
I don't even really know if I can place where everybody's at spiritually. Yeah. But I know there's all these elements. There's 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 Christianity, there's yeah. Buddhism, there's five yeah. percent, there's African spirituality, there's yeah. all these elements mixed into one. But also like really delving into the spirituality, questioning, you know, some of the institutions, particularly on that record, questioning the institutions, but still leaning heavily into the spirituality. Yeah. What makes this group decide? to put spirituality so much in the forefront of what y'all do? That's, That's a great question. question. I, I think <laughs> okay. for me, I believe in it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I believe in spirit. I believe that we are just here passing and that the spirit is what goes on. Mm -hmm. The spirit is what really is all the battles that we're witnessing throughout the world. It's really a spiritual battle mm -hmm. with human shells, you know, sort of navigating the spiritual battle and warfare. So I've always believed in that. But I will say that we never wanted to be like a religious group. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? We never wanted to do that. We always strayed away from that. There's been numerous times when, you know, religious labels wanted to try to do something with us mm -hmm. or try to take us further in that direction. And that's not what we ever wanted to do. And um, yeah, I always felt like it's a thing. And, and not only that, I always felt like spirituality, Christianity in particular, which we're sort of kneeling on on that, on that record, Fisher for Religion, mm -hmm. has to have an element of practicality and, and, and uh, activism that is associated with it for it to be real to me. You know, in the, in the scriptures of the Bible, it talks about faith without deeds is dead. That's right. And so having those deeds is so important. And so that's what we're sort of like, you know, punching on in a sense. Uh, liberation know? theology. Liberation theology, yeah. exactly. So that's important, you know what I mean? And, and to me, that's what we always have incorporated in this crew, um, despite different spiritual paths that people right. take in the crew mm -hmm. and stuff like that, you know? Definitely. Yeah. I, when I started with, <laughs> no, with the yeah. band, one of the, my favorite pieces of the choreography was what we do during F Fishing for Religion. We have the prayer hands and we have the dua hands. And I was raised Muslim. Mm -hmm. So it really struck me that it was a synergy between those two religions because of, in, historically they tend to be at odds. Mm -hmm. But they're really both saying the same thing is That's what right. I was learning. You know, my, my, my stepfather, he's an imam here in Atlanta or here in, 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 in California. I'm in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah. I'm not in Atlanta. Right. Here in California, Master Bilal Abdul Karim Hassan, he raised me in Islam. Mm -hmm. And so for us to do that movement and in the choreography, it just, it was just a really amazing experience for me mm -hmm. as I performed that song. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and so me being from the South is Bible Belt mm -hmm. in Georgia. It's like a church on every corner, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so for me, when we would do um, fishing for relig religion, it was very um, just reminiscent of seeing like people say when they catch the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. and that, and just that whole release. You see, Bob OJ, he's turning with his hands up, and then you have the 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 uh, offering, uh, you know. What is it? A bucket or, mm -hmm. or yeah, like tides. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and every you know when we would perform that song, you kind of saw the different uh, characters, if you will, in mm -hmm. represented in the church. That's interesting. And it was it for me. It always felt very spiritual because I think listening to that record, because I remember when we did the EPK for it, we were out in front of a church. Yep. You remember that? I do remember that very much. So. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. it was about going against. Um, I think sometimes tradition mm -hmm. can take you down the wrong path. Just because it's, tr it's tradition doesn't mean it's right. That's right. And so I think in the song, that's what it was about. So that's what it always represented to me. Yeah. And just kind of finding, it's because, you know, uh, having a relation with God is personal. That's you know right. what I mean? A personal thing. So if you see the performance, you see everybody kind of personally doing their own thing. Yeah. And getting connected to whatever source, you know, I'm a Christian, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And to, to that point, your religious or your spiritual journey is it should be authentic. Yeah. A lot of times people focus a lot on the the ritualistic aspect of religion. So it's like this is what you do because this is the rules of that religion and miss the point of doing those things. Mm -hmm. Why do we pray? Whether it's five times a day or at before in you know your food mm -hmm. or 
at, at, when you before you go to bed, why are you doing these things? Yeah. And so that's what it speaks to. So you're fishing for the reasons why yeah. you should have this connection. And I think that walks across all religions. I agree. I agree. This is not usually the type of music content that wins Grammys. <laughs> but I mean, winning no for, for you, right? For y'all to win two Grammys in 1993, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't think people who are paying attention to the music business now understand how big that was Huge. for for a hip hop group. Yeah. yeah. Not just a hip hop group, but a conscious, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, African cent, Afrocentric, yeah. sp- spiritually minded hip hop group yeah. to win not just one, yeah. but two Grammys. It was huge. Yeah, it was huge. First of all, thank you for that. Aww. But also, at the time, hip hop was fighting for a place on the Grammy stage. I think y'all might have been the first, one of the first groups to have be televised. Yes. Yeah. Um, mm. Chuck D said, I, I I don't give a fuck about a goddamn Grammy. Exactly. Jay-Z, after y'all was boycotting the Grammys. Yeah, exactly. So was there any sort of pushback or did the success of the pop success or having a Grammy ever make y'all feel disconnected from the community? Um, no, I wouldn't say that. No, I don't think so. I, I will say, you know, for me personally, I grew up watching the Grammys as a young kid. You know what I mean? And... The Grammys was the highlight of my year mm. as a musician and as an artist, as a creative. So I'll never forget when I saw Herbie Hancock and Grand Mix of DST. Yeah. That the is rock forever rock. ingrained yeah. in my mind because that was, for me, not coming from New York, the first time I ever saw a person scratch. I heard it on record. I never saw it. I never understood the mechanics behind it. So when I'm seeing DST do what he's doing for the Rocket Joint, which I loved. That was a revolutionary record for hip hop mm-hmm. to me, for me, because that was the first time that that it just thrusted that art form into the mainstream. Right. Not to mention the fact that Herbie Hancock is now a foundational member of the hip hop community because of that record. Facts. Yeah. Yeah. Facts. And so. And it connects the elders with the youth. In the without a question. Ways, yeah. Without a question. Yeah. And so, like, for me, it, having something that is truly for the people, by the people. And yet it get into that mainstream bloodstream that's out here Mm -hmm. has always been something that moves me deeply. More recent example, in my opinion, at least, and I might be, the show might be wrong, but it was either Saturday Night Live or Jimmy Fallon where you and Yassine did some of your new material. Yeah, it was Saturday Night Live. That to me was a great example of that. Like the rawness of what you guys present and what you guys do, but it being on Saturday Night Live to me, it was a revolutionary moment similar to the Grammys for us back in the wow. 90s. That's in, big in, for in me because in I grew up 90s. watching SNL. It's mm-hmm. an important show to me. It is to me And too. never in the history of SNL have they ever had a quote-unquote underground rap group. Right. But definitely not someone. We didn't, that, that record we dropped last year, now on Bandcamp. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wasn't something that was a pop hit, a pop success. Exactly, so exactly. I've never seen someone perform at SNL that didn't have a, a current hit. That's my besides point. Besides a legacy group. That was my point. Mm-hmm. You know, when and, I saw that, I was yeah. like, yeah. this is a major moment right now. Mm-hmm. It was a major moment. And it's like, to me, any of those types of uh, those times, you know, just like we're talking about how Herbie Hancock and DST did for us and how Arrested Development did for you earlier. Mm-hmm. We know that when those little things break through, it is influencing a million or more kids that's from right. across the planet that's in right. some form yeah. or fashion at that very moment. And to me, that's magical. Like, that is a very specific moment when somebody, a light bulb is going off on probably millions and millions of people's heads. That's right. Yeah. That's that's right. You know what I'm saying? It was, I think it was a refreshing moment because um, it was like during that time in music, when we won the Grammys, first of all, we were shocked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Especially when we won Best New Artist, because we thought Billy Ray Cyrus was going to win. Because he right. had that huge record. <laughs> Achy, breaky, Achy, breaky heart. heart. And we were like, what? You know? Yeah. Um, but I just think it was like a breath of fresh air at that time. Yeah. And I think um, that's why we won. I really believe I think it was something that was needed at mm-hmm. the time musically. 
uh, frequency wise mm. in the world, mm -hmm. and I think that's why we won. And it and, and it was beautiful because again, goes back to all the different type of people that's represented in the group. You got yeah. Bob OJ with this gray afro winning his a Grammy. You that's know? right. And he's yeah. this oh you know Bob yeah. had to be how old by then? Yeah, by then by I'm his not 60s, sure. Probably maybe? about sixty. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean it was just yeah. awesome, you know. And 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 then to think about the people who like never have won Grammys legends. Mm -hmm. And our first time out, we won two. Yeah. I was like, what, 16 or 17 when that happened. Wow. Yeah. I didn't oh, realize shot. how young you were. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah she was... And y'all are similar age. Same age. Right. Yeah, yeah. Are similar age. Yeah. yeah, From high school, like, yeah. right. these are my peers. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And that's um, why representation crazy. is important. Like, yes, that's absolutely. what the first time we're seeing this happen on oh, a yeah. huge stage like that. That's important because it's going to spark something in, in a young person to say, what's possible? That's right. Yeah. That's facts. Now, People Every Day is one of the most important hip-hop songs ever made. Thank um, you. Thank you. You know, you know, I started DJing later, and yeah. that's what that's a staple. And it's like, yeah. for y'all to be talking about what y'all talking about on that record, <laughs> yeah, and it still be a party hit yeah, exactly, that you yeah. could play at the party at yeah. the peak hour right now, yeah. it's an amazing feat. It is. Um, did you see Bob James... On People's Party. I did. You did? I did. So I you saw, started talking about... Especially that section where you Oh, you saw that about. part. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we talked about it right yeah. there. I saw it somewhere. You know what I'm saying? It's someone someone, someone forwarded it to me. <laughs> yeah, check this out. Right. You know now, he did say that y'all settled. And, yeah. but, and, and Bob James' journey with sampling is very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. I did a residency with him at Blue Note, Facts. which is amazing to me. Yeah. I introduced him to Slick Rick. Mm -hmm. I introduced Dope. him to DMC. I remember DMC, Dope. who, you know, that, that like, they had a couple of records yeah, over to yeah, Bob yeah, James, yeah, yeah. and DMC saw him and was like... Yeah. And for him, it was crazy to realize that artists are artists. Artists are always going to get along. Exactly. But I told him, I said, I said, it was... For young black kids who grew up listening to Bob James records, exactly, that seemed like outer space to us. Facts. His whole yeah. thing was like, "I'm still alive. Exactly. Why didn't no one tell me? I would have, <laughs> right. I would have showed up in the studio, right. got right. down with exactly. y'all." Yeah. But I'm like, "Yo, we were sampling records from our parents' collection exactly. that we had no relationship with. It wasn't no social media. Exactly. No shout right. out to yeah. Pink yeah. Sifu. I had yeah. him on the show, yeah. and he had Big Rube from from mm -hmm. Dungeon Family. Yeah. I said, uh -huh. "How you, how you get Big Rube? How would you even know about Big Rube? Exactly. Yeah. And how you get Big Rube on your album? Because yeah. I DM'd him on Instagram." Instagram. And he <laughs> answered like me. that. Right, yeah. right. I said that there was so much crazy. Right. Like <laughs> I'm sure y'all might y'all probably would have considered DMing Bob right. James at the right. time if that was a, right. an right. option. Because it wasn't yeah. like you're gonna get him on the phone. Like, right. hey, just call up Bob James right quick. Let me get him on this record. Yeah. See, this Who is what's let me say one piece about that because mm -hmm. we are still to this day going through a lot of drama with the sampling of that record for people every day. Mm -hmm. The truth is, we got the sample cleared. Day one, before we ever released the single, uh -huh. we got it cleared by his publishing company, right? And then our label, EMI at the time, was doing a, a, a switcheroo trying to make more money. Mm -hmm. What they did is they started licensing the version that everybody around the world loves and celebrates, which is the Bob James, the version with his... The Metamorphosis sample. mix. Mm -hmm. The Metamorphosis mix. Yeah. They started putting that on various different sync licenses and places around the world while actually calling it the regular mix on mm -hmm. our album, which doesn't have a Bob James sample in it. And the reason Pretty they did sneaky, that... Sis. Mm. Pretty <laughs> sneaky, sis. Pretty sneaky, sis. So what they did is they, they were able to make way more money from it because mm. they had a bigger percentage in that particular version. And so Bob James heard his version on a um, Tyler Perry movie because... Um, Mary J. Blige and Music Soul Child did a record. Wait, Bob James was watching the Tyler Perry movie? I guess. This is, <laughs> like, this is breaking news. <laughs> breaking news. <laughs> Next time you see it, we got to have it. Like, yeah. <laughs> All I know is that movie came out. They did that version. And I think Jermaine might have produced it. Diary of a Mad Black Woman, Bob James. <laughs> exactly right. What <laughs> that? The I'm so, sorry. No, right. this is, that's the truth. So, like, um, he heard... He heard his record on there, mm -hmm. looked at the credits, realized that he didn't get credit on that because EMI switched it. Mm -hmm. And we got sued and we've been in a lawsuit with that for years. And mm -hmm. then, like you said, we settled just recently. So, you know, it is just one of those little side realities of the yeah. industry. You know, He has a new record out with Corey Moe. I asked you about Corey Moe from Atlanta. That's, yeah, that's yeah. the homie. 
Um, I haven't heard his new record, but I'm going to check it out. I will definitely shout out to Bob to, James. Yeah, shout out to Bob James. Um, now, um, Zinga Lama Dooney. Yeah. <laughs> this record changed my life. Word, thank like, you. Like, Arrested Development, the first record, the, the three years, made me feel like, oh, I, I, told, I told you, it made me feel like I was in the group. Yeah, yeah, you told me that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it was something going on with this second record. I feel like, I mentioned this in the intro, but I feel like, after the just just my speculation as a fan, I feel like after the Grammys, it's like y'all doubled down on the spirituality and the consciousness and and the musicality of of it all, right? And it's like records like Pride and United yeah. Front. These yeah. are just very special records. Um, Aching for Acres and Mr. Landlord. You had two records dealing with land ownership. Yeah, exactly. Um, for Black people in the South, particularly in Atlanta. Yeah. There's a lot more focus on that, I think, than from where I'm from. Yeah, exactly. Can you break That's down true. why, why yeah. land ownership was so important for you to deal with on this album? Yeah, self-determination. Yeah, knowledge you know? self, yeah. And for us, it was a matter of having your own land, being able to determine what you want to do with your own land, having that property value. Because at the time, we were so engulfed and getting that new car, getting his new shoes, this, you know, whatever the clothing items was at the time. And it's like, no, get, get you some land. Mm. And so Acre for Acres was one of those joints. And, and I, I, right before I wrote that song, the group was huge at this time. I went back to Clark Atlanta University. Um, well, I never went there before, but I went to Clark Atlanta University, took a black history class because I just liked the intellectual surroundings of it all, right? And um, Professor Black was one of, the, one of my professors at Clark. And we were talking about that issue in class. And I said, you know what? I'm going to write a tune called Aching for Acres. And that's, I lived out that tune. Like literally, after we released that record, Zingala Maduni, I went to Fayetteville, which is a, um, a rural side of Atlanta, mm -hmm. bought 11 acres of land, still there to this day. Everything I talk about, in most of the records, to be honest, but especially in that record, lived out specifically, you know, just step by step, yeah. just striving to, you know, have that power base. So, yeah, that, that, that self-determination is what that was about. And I, again, I can't stress how much I'm influenced by this group because y'all influenced my language. You know, I have a record called Knowledge of Self-Determination. You Facts. know, there's a lot, I know. When, I, when I went back and revisited the catalog as I'm studying for this interview, I'm realizing I already knew that I was hugely influenced by Arrested Development. Word but up. I'm like, yo, it, 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 this group influenced the way that I spoke Word. on the beats. You know what I'm saying? I have a song on my new album called Nat Turner. Word up. Featuring Sean Kuti, the son of Fela Kuti, yeah. and, and, and Casper Neoves from South Africa. Dope. And, you know... Y'all mentioned Nat Turner on this record. Facts. I have. I went down to visit. I sat with Asada. Y'all shout out exactly, Asada. You yeah. talked about yep. uh, Black Studies at Clark. Like exactly. you're talking about Patrice Lumumba on this exactly record. Exactly right. Yeah. And what's important, and I'm glad that we have the sisters here, is like yeah. you're speaking about the divine feminine on this record. Facts. Yeah. And for everybody, tell me about why it's so important for this group to have so so much feminine energy, and especially in the hip hop space. Yeah. yeah. Do well, I want to hit that the women are always the energy that drives the music. Mm -hmm. yeah, Historically. Absolutely. That's why you're singing. You're singing to us. But <laughs> the thing, she's not lying. <laughs> she's not lying. But but it's important to celebrate that and the power of that. Mm -hmm. The power. Yep. And and also, I think what we do as a group, we celebrate how we are presented can change the shift of how we're represented in the music. Mm -hmm. You know, I I was also the salt shaker in yep. the Yin Yang Twins video. Yep. So shout out to the Yin oh, Yang okay. Twins. Yeah. You're like fully Atlanta. Like. I'm yeah, all the way ATL, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for real, yeah. for real. But, you know, in music, it, every facet of womanhood that's represented can go one way or the other. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see someone like Ishii being you know, regal and, you know, Afro Afrocentric mm -hmm. and, and unapologetically big and explosive. Yeah. And then you can look at another, like a rock video, and see a woman on a leash. Right. Yeah. Like, what? So the way that you present and revere your woman will shape 
the generation and and it will shape how women view themselves. Yeah. There's a way to be sensual and sexy without being raunchy or um, diminished. Um, there's a way to be, you know, to support your king without mm-hmm. feeling like you have to be small. That's mm-hmm. right. And so right. that's what we see in our group. You know, Ishii was standing next to, you know, headliner and speech, that's but she didn't have to be small and diminished. She can be as explosive and beautiful and energetic. And, mm-hmm. you know, you can see skin. You know, you saw her bald head and her beautiful <laughs> body, Shiny but you did body. not feel, <laughs> you didn't feel like it was anything wrong or, yeah. or um, explicit about it. You felt empowered. At least I did as a woman. Yeah. And so that, you, it's important for young women to see that. Yes, indeed. I don't know if this is true, but I feel like and it's, I was so excited to meet Shah Rock from Funky Four. So was I. Bro, I was so excited because yeah. for me, that was the first time I ever saw in hip hop men and women in the exact same group. Mm-hmm. To my knowledge, we were the second, but I'm not sure. Uh, I, you know, I, I, you never know because there might be people that cruise that I don't mm-hmm. know about. But to my knowledge, we was the second. Believe it or not, it just wasn't a thing that was happening a lot. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, there wasn't a lot of hip hop crews that had both men and women in it until. To my knowledge, at least till after us, after yeah. Shot right. Rocking him. Yeah. So it's just an interesting thing that I felt like was important. It was intentional. And the woman energy to me, you know, like I told you, my mother started this, the largest black newspaper in Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. So to me, it just made sense. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and for yeah. me, I, th- I think just being in a group, all I saw was like educated, powerful, amazing black women. You know, I came from one. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to bring what I know yeah, <laughs> to the exactly table right, yeah. and just do me. You know what I mean? And so, and it worked. Yeah, no doubt. And <laughs> shout out to Airly Tari as well. <laughs> Airly yeah, Tari was Tari, yes. you know, absolutely, incredible. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. She yeah. brought and a lot Dion. of great energy to that yes. record. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Dion Ferris, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Without yeah. a question. Who was not part of the group? Yeah, she was not a part of the group. But she was a guest. And Paul Ed, and it was a whole bunch of Yeah, yeah. But it was the power of the representation of the women in the group that pushes the energy forward. Yes. I agree. Yes. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yes. I also like the fact that I'm, I'm a huge fan of um, Revolution well, uh, from the Thank Malcolm you. X soundtrack, a very important record, but also noticed at right after y'all did Revolution on the intro for the second album, you it's a tribute to the Do the Right Thing to the Sam Jackson Sweet Daddy Love thing where you're yeah, yeah. doing the roll call for yeah. all the... All the artists, and that was that yeah. was that was brilliant. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, that, that was, was um, Baba OJ's thing, where you know we had WMFW, which stands for We Must Fight and Win, and Baba OJ listed off all these various artists, which I gave him the list of artists because he <laughs> some of these artists he never heard right. of. You know what I'm saying? Like Baba was on a whole other generation, right. <laughs> but um, but it was dope because again, for us, it was about trying to. We knew that we were being. Um, sort of separated Mm -hmm. from the pack by the industry. And we were, that was an attempt for us to strive to say, no, no, we're all, we're trying to do this together. Yeah. You know what Mm -hmm. I'm saying? We're trying to move, we're trying to move together. Yeah. So these were all groups that we we loved from all different types of genres too. That also was a dream for us to just to have more representation from all of our distant, uh, uh, all of our distinct artistic viewpoints mm-hmm. more representation together let's 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 all move together you yes, know what indeed. I mean? so yeah one of the first things i noticed from this group and i'm sure you've heard these comparisons before and you've actually in your records used uh, a lot of their music is comparisons to sly and the family stone yeah. yeah bob dylan early in your career put y'all started comparing y'all to this group yeah uh, y'all actually covered if you want me to stay yeah exactly. which is yeah, what we did. Yeah. a classic so what is it about Let's give that group their flowers. What is it about yes. that group that influences <laughs> this group so much? Well, first of all, you know, Sly and the Family Stone is literally one of the best and most revolutionary crews ever. A lot of what we are is what they were mm-hmm. already. Mixing men and women in the group. Mm-hmm. Um, now we even have people of different ethnic backgrounds in our group because J.J. Boogie is a white brother from Italy, mm-hmm. you know, in our crew. But they had that already. They had powerful women Singing and representing very powerfully mm-hmm. as Sly and, and the other brothers was representing on, on a masculine energy too. So it was a family energy similar to what we are, you know, what Arrested Development is. But I'll be honest, when I first dug deep into Sly and the Family Stone, 
none of that really, I, was, I wasn't aware of any of that mm -hmm. when I decided to use that people every day or everyday people um, chorus. It was just, we liked the chorus mm -hmm. and there was a particular drum break that everybody used to use back mm -hmm. then. <laughs> That and back then the records used to be panned to where the drums were panned totally on the left side, so you could actually get a clear sample of that beat, which is why you know one eight seven on the undercover cop. You right. know, everybody Jungle Brothers was using it. Jungle Brothers, Jungle. You know, everybody used that same beat, but it was because it was so easily accessible as a producer, and I just loved their. I loved what they presented musically. And then I learned later how much similarity and, and, and sort of energy spirits that we was both putting out, well, they, they were putting out much earlier than us, and then we would later put out was so similar. Like, you know, it, it didn't dawn on me until later. Right. Yeah. I do feel like my love for Sly and the Family Stone is probably what helped to draw me to this group. Mm -hmm. Sure, um, yeah. Because I listen to their music a lot of times. Yeah. Um, on this record, um, Heroes of the Harvest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have spoken about how this record was sort of signified a difficult time in your life. Yeah. Right? Whereas, like, the group had this huge success, yeah. all these records sold, and then this record doesn't sell. Yeah. And then you're questioning yourself, your, yourself as an artist. You're questioning the group. Um, for people who have never been through that, and you're, you're, you've, you've gone through that, and now you've come out on the other side... Can you sort of walk us through that and maybe give advice for people who might be questioning themselves and feeling depressed because of, they're not getting what they want out of life? Yeah. Well, it's funny. That was really, for me, that was the Zingal Amaduni album. Ah, okay. That I felt that way. Okay. You know, by the time we started to do the Heroes of the, um, Heroes of the Ar Harvest record, at that time, the group was just, we were starting to have meetings, starting to talk again. Mm -hmm. Ishii started that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was like, yo, we need to do more stuff. Right. Because by that time, I had a successful solo career in Japan. Right. I was licensing records to Japan. Every one of them was going gold. Every one, all of my tours were sold out. Every one of them was going top 10. And I was living on sort of a whole different experience musically. And Ishii called me and she was like, we need to do more. The people want more from Arrested Development. And I agreed. I'd always wanted that anyway, but we were in such a not just me and Ishii, but me, Ishii, Headliner, everybody in the group was in such of, um, a tender place mm -hmm. that it was tough for us. I think if Ishii wouldn't have suggested it first, it probably mm -hmm. never would have happened. Then we did Heroes of the Harvest. To back up on Zingalama Duni, that record sold about five, well, it did sell 500,000 units, which is beautiful. It's a gold right. record. But compared to the four million that we sold on the, uh, on the three years record, it felt to me as a producer, as a writer, as a leader of a group, it felt like a failure. And I it's was crazy so depressed. to hear that because that record really impacted me mm -hmm. so heavily. No, I appreciate that. But that you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like yeah, obviously yeah. it wasn't as big as a success, but it right, was like, yeah. for me it was like, this is it. Well, so you know, that's what I love. Like how I met Joni Mitchell's music was way after her career and all her highlights and lows and all of that ever existed. I just got to listen to the music for what it was. And that's what I love about what time does with any artist, is that putting out what you believe to be your best material at the time and letting people meet it or get introduced to it at their own timing, devoid of what the media is saying about it, devoid of what the reviewers are saying about mm -hmm. it, or what that the previous record before that did in sales. Just devoid of all of that, just allowing the music to stand on its own merits. And that's what I believe you came to it with, you know, that yeah. kind of viewpoint. And I think so many millions of fans that we've heard about will say the same about that record. Like, some people say it was their favorite record, even above the first record. So, for me, though, it was a tough period. I ain't gonna lie. It was a really tough period. We, at, the, at that time, at that record's time, we were touring in two different tour buses, mm -hmm. We were um, sort of sort of camped out, you know, part of the group in one camp, part of the group in another camp. And, you know, you can speak on your experience <laughs> on it, but that's yeah. what I remember during that time. It was a tough time. Yeah, it you know was. What I, mean? um, I think from, especially, especially like, so the three of us, Speech, Headliner, and myself, 
we were together for many, many years before the group came out. We had people would come in and out. Yeah. So for me, I think it was a lot more personal. And yeah. I was so young. I was 13 when I met them. Yeah. Right? So then when we got on, when we got to the Zingle, I'm doing a record. Yeah. And then we just were not in a good place. You know, I think also coming into this business, being ignorant of the business. Yeah. And I do um, feel like um, ego had a lot to do with it. Facts. <laughs> Facts. With, I think, everybody. And then also just not knowing the business. Like, yeah. you know, nobody took us by the hand and said, come on, let me show you how this goes. So I know for me personally, I didn't know about publishing, none yeah. of that kind of stuff. You know, it was just like, I just want to get on stage and dance and sing and perform. And so I think that um, as yeah. you grow and evolve, and it, and it just, everything moves so fast. I mean, it was just like, literally, we went to sleep and we woke up and we were like famous because we were a buzz clip on MTV and it really changed our lives. And I don't think any of us were really prepared for that. No, all, definitely period. not. No, how and could so you? Yeah. I think that had a lot to do with, and, and just... Everybody, you know, at this time, like, um, I think Speech Jahi was being, was he born or I don't around think he that was time? Born, yeah, but, he, but yeah. yeah, he was actually. Folks Jahi was having was born. babies and mm -hmm. it was family, it was Our different. Son. So yeah. it was like, you move differently when those things happen, yeah. you know? And so it was, it was, it was rough for me. Um, and I remember when they told me they wanted to put me on the album cover, um, even there was some people in the group was like, why she got to be on the cover? Yeah, no, it was. <laughs> it was that. Yeah, yeah, it was. You know, and yeah. that was hurtful for me because I had yeah. been there from the beginning, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so I just journeyed on. And as Speech was saying, when we got to Heroes of the Harvest, I've always kind of been the ones like, come on, everybody, let's get back together. Let's right, right. <laughs> yeah. And it just, always you know, smiling. I'm Ishi. just always trying to pull, yeah. you know, just because I knew that we had so much more to say. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was cut off at a infant stage. To be honest. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I mean, I still have people to this day say, what happened? What happened? What yeah. happened? So, you know, um, but thank God for healing. Thank God for growth. I think those years apart helped us, you know, to grow and just be better people. Because by the time we came back, I was grown. We were mm. all grown, grown. Facts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Facts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So sometimes that needs to be done. Speaking of growth, I believe this song is on this album we were talking about, On Conscious. Yeah. Is a record that yeah. for me was very powerful, right? Word because on. Thanks. one of the things I did learn from the group yeah. was okay, you can, you gotta be conscious, you gotta be about the culture, but it's about right. the people, it's about right. the proletarian, it's yeah. about the people who are out here working jobs. Exactly. They, they don't have time to maybe be academic or go to Clark. Exactly. And this and that. Yeah. And you Facts. exhibit a lot of growth on that song yeah. where you talk about, you say, maybe I was judgmental. Yeah, exactly. Um, speak on that a little bit. Yeah, so I mean, you know, being sort of pigeonholed into that conscious piece, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, um, you know, indirect things that people are sort of expected to do, eat, be like, mm -hmm. whatever. You know what I'm saying? And I think at that time I was trying to shed what is just like you're saying, okay, wait a minute. This is all of these kind of cultural things that happen within this sort of space. Mm -hmm. But what if, what are these things... Are what of these things are necessary to actually help the people rise? Right. And putting aside whatever people's preferences are as far as this, that, and the third, and putting to the forefront what is the things that actually matter at the end of the day? Yeah. And striving to unite based on those things. And um, so that's that's what that song is basically about. You yes, know? indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah. It's a great song. Thank you. Um, this it. record... Craft and Optics yeah. is such an incredible album. There's so many albums that you'll have, so I don't have time to talk about all of them, but I yeah. want to talk about this record because yeah. of the mantra that you say on this record. Mm -hmm. You say, um, I must never connect my craft to the optics because sight has never been a friend to truth. That's so real, bro. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that, man. I appreciate you loving that record, too. That's a very important record for me. Mm -hmm. And um, for us as a crew, you know what I'm saying? It's just... It's a very important record. So yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, that the song um I don't I don't see you at the club is what you were talking about. People are like, what happened? I don't, exactly. I don't see you at the club. <laughs> exactly. He was right, like, I yeah. don't see you at the bank. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's bars yeah. right there. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, you tell a story about a, adoption on that record, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that's a true story? Uh-huh. It is. Yeah, okay. it sure is. Um I'm seeing marriage is dying just like miscarriages. We've been at it two zero years, talking about my queen and I. We've been at it two zero years, changing the narrative. Father to my two kids, plus to add to my parenting. We took on a team with a desperate need of a family. 
He was jacking cars and some other type of insanity, playing the role that media says is his humanity. Blast is getting smoked with police taking a tote. They hate it when we do stand up, but yet they like a joke, meaning mm. the police are like a joke. You know, so people losing hope, you know, I go on and on. But the point right. is, is like, we, we, we adopted a brother that is really a close friend of my son, our son Jahi, not legally adopted him, but brought him into our family to help to raise him. And that's the point of this record, really, at the end of the day, that let me breathe, let me, let me move, let me be me. Mm -hmm. Because so many times people are expecting you to be like at all of the scenes and everywhere and everywhere. And I'm like, no, we're trying to raise these kids. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's like what Dayla said, one of their joints. We're trying to raise these kids. It's like we're trying to do the things that a lot of people complain wasn't done for their generation. We're striving to actually be those things, mm -hmm. do those things, actually get the land, actually raise these kids, actually strive to be there with our loved one and our mate. You know what I'm saying? So, like, these are the things we're actually striving to put into motion. Do, do the work. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Do the actual work. Yeah. Be an example of it in real life. You know what I'm saying? So... That's that's what that record's talking about. Well, I appreciate it. Well, even yeah, man, with I, I Don't it. See You at the Club, it's yeah. kind of a double entendre as well because people always ask that about Arrested Development. So, <laughs> right. Because we're so big all over the world, but we don't have as much of a foothold now in American market. And so, you know, being from a, the video background as a dancer, if, if they don't see you in a video, mm -hmm. it was like, well... Are you working? Are you doing? Right. I'm like, actually, I'm on. I'm on the road. I'm doing shows. Like yeah. you might not see me because you didn't get the ticket to that show, yeah. right. or you weren't at the concert. Or you but, need better friends. Or you need, <laughs> friends. <laughs> <laughs> you need better friends. And that was kind of my experience growing up as a dancer, and, yeah. and then especially in the in the scene, it's like, well, we didn't see you in. The, I did that. I did the Saw Shaker, and then we you do other videos. But if you're not in a video, we don't see you. In the club, mm -hmm. it's like, are you really doing anything? It's like, yeah, we we doing stuff. Like yeah. we're touring all over the world, and we we're still performing. Yeah. And so it's not like we're, we've gone anywhere. Exactly. So yeah. I felt that's what it it really was saying, kind of on the surface level. But mm -hmm. then you know, obviously the message in the mm -hmm. lyrics. Now I get it. I'm a conscious artist, but one thing that I prided myself on in my career was I was. I was the, the conscious artist that very intentionally was at every single club. Right. I was exactly. at strip clubs. Yeah. I was at the, all the clubs. No doubt. Because yeah. I wanted to show them that I can do what you do. Exactly. And it was, yeah. and I, you know, I, I enjoyed it to a large degree. But now when I think back of those times, I put a lot of energy and effort into making sure I was in the right section and right, making sure right, I had right, the I right you. bottle and making yeah, sure I yeah. had the right gear on yeah, yeah, making yeah, sure I said yeah. what's up to the right people. Exactly. I don't care about any of that stuff anymore. Right. right. Exactly. When, I was, yeah. when I was doing it, yeah. it was very important. Yeah, right. exactly. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, I do know what you're saying. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah. I, the, all the like, I think about all the energy I put into that and that how I use that energy now and I'm so much more uh, productive, <laughs> productive yeah. and effective. Yeah, I feel but at that. the same time, as you know, America, the American market is a very fickle market. It's like out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. It's so many people that love us, love the rest of development. They're like, what? Y'all are still, y'all are still doing shows. That's right. Yes. I just ran into y'all, and in, where were we in the UK? In yeah, Car exactly. Cardiff? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We was in Cardiff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You was rocking with Dayla, yeah. actually, yeah. right? Yeah. Is that right? And that was, yeah. and there's a huge sea of people. Facts. That they, if they think yeah. that you're not in the club right now, exactly right. That exactly you're not doing right. that. And it's like I'm out here watching the rest of development rock seas of people. Facts. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Y'all just came from Australia and facts. Yeah. Y'all go to Australia, Australia all Africa, over the world. Yeah, yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. this part, this question, if we don't want, if we don't want to talk about it, we can leave it out. Okay. Um, but I feel like Arrested Development, as a group that has performed in Jerusalem, yeah, um, as uniquely positioned. Yeah. to speak on the current situation in Israel and Palestine. Not, not a current situation. It's a long going, it's been decades and decades of this, but it's yeah. in the news right now. Yeah, right? So I, I just want, if you had anything that y'all want to speak about with that situation. Yeah. For me, personally, I stand with the people, the real people. So I, I'm, I'm generally against the powers that be, the governments that try to rule things, and I'm with the real people. I spend time in Israel. I know real people in Israel. I know I spent time in Palestine and spent time with the Palestinians. My point is, is that to me, this, this, this issue of oppression is a historic and very real thing that I'm 100% against. And at the same time, 
you know, I have ties with, with people on, on, on all sides. And it's, mm -hmm. it's a very tough thing. It's a very sad thing. To me, it always goes back to this idea of white supremacy and people feeling like they have a right to your life, to your land, to your mm -hmm. anything. To me, this is, a, this is a bad concept. It has been historically and it continues to be today. Mm -hmm. People have to be able to fight to be able to have their own dignity, their self-determination. I believe in that wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I do feel for, you know, the people that's been, the innocent lives that have been lost on, on all sides. And it's, it's, I'll be honest, Taleb, it, 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 it deeply disturbs my spirit. Mm -hmm. And I know that we're living in a time that historically will go down as a very, very important moment in the history of this world. And... Um, Yeah, it's, it's just very disturbing on many levels. You know what I'm saying? I understand. Yeah. That's what I feel. I was um, doing more research ever since it's been in the news. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's a lot of religious undertones that are mixed in with political agendas. That's true. That I feel like is such a gross mishandling and misrepresentation of people's faith to... to You, you have to be human first. Like if you believe in God or if you mm -hmm. practice whatever faith that you subscribe to, nothing on either side that's, that's going on is supported by these faiths. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's like you have to love your fellow man. You have to lead with love. And that's not what's happening here because of the political agenda. That's right. And it's a disservice to all the religions involved, all the religious faith and beliefs involve it's a disservice to use to to carry out these atrocities in the name of whichever side yeah. you're on that's that's the harsh the, the the worst thing to me that's happening you're you're seeing these babies and families and human beings being destroyed in the name of whatever and I, that's just blasphemous i agree Also, I want to say I really appreciated how you handled this situation mm. on your IG. You know, you did a post early on in this, in this new version of the conflict, right? Meaning the new stuff that's happening recently. And I thought you handled it very well on both sides and just really talked about, and I can't speak for you, but from what I remember about the post, you talked about the pain on both sides. And you also talked about being willing to stand up for what's right, even if it jeopardizes opportunities. Yeah. Which I've had throughout my career numerous times, and I know you have too. Absolutely. I really respect that. I think that that's necessary for us as artists to be able to stand up for what's right and to be a beacon for what's right um, when people are confused. You know what I mean? So I, I, I respect that. Well, once again, this is something that I've learned that it's okay for me to do from paying attention to groups like Arrested Development. Word up. So I thank y'all for the inspiration for that. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of these newer records. Sure. Um, Don't Fight Your Demons, which yeah. I think is, is, a, is a very poetic title yeah. for a record. And this record, Young Americans, yeah. um, that y'all did. There's a record, Jay wrote from The Alcoholics. He, he lived in Sweden for some time. Okay. And he had a record that I love called... Stupid Americans, right? <laughs> yeah. And the hook was, where's the McDonald's? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's Fact. the McDonald's? I've heard that, that said a million times yes. by American <laughs> tourists. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I yeah. feel like Young Americans yeah. is maybe the, the more conscious version of that J. Rowe record. Because you're speaking about running into people overseas and their pre uh, preconceived the perception. notions. Yeah. Perception of Americans. Yeah. This is something that I could really relate to. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, that record right there, um, I love that record. It's, it's not just that particular song, but that whole album is a poetic joint for me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that record is really talking about a lot of the people we meet, at least, who really are dying to get to America because of the opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And see, especially African Americans sometimes, as not getting it. Like, yo, you don't get the opportunity you have. You know, you, you guys are talking about X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. and you don't get these opportunities. And so it's, that whole record is a story. It's a story record. And it's, yeah. a, it's a conversation between me and a woman who's from some of these, these places. And 
she's saying, I want to get to America. And I'm saying, I want to get to Africa. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. And so it's this, it's this conversation between two different viewpoints about the same country. Yeah. Yes, indeed. That reminds me of a, the Fela Kuti story about when he first came to America. I think yeah, he was in the just, Bay Area. Uh-huh. And he met this sister who was yep, telling him exactly. you need to be more focused yep. on... And that, that inspired him to do what his, his yeah. whole trajectory changed from that point yeah, on. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly, yeah. Um, you also say on one of these records, the same people who sell the sickness sell, sell the pill. Exactly. Mm-hmm. The same yeah. people who sell the sickness sell, sell the, the pill. Yeah, exactly. It's a bar. Yeah. Word up. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate bar. that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned, so we have a similar experience, touring with James Brown on his last days. Uh, yeah. James Brown died yeah. on Christmas yeah, of his particular year. I'm not, I don't remember the exact year. Me either, I forgot. I yeah. was touring in Australia with Estelle, Bahamadia, Supernatural, Wow. And James James wow. Brown. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't really get to have a conversation with James Brown, but mm-hmm. I got to saw how he moved. And this was mm-hmm. like the last month mm-hmm. of wow. him touring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, he did wow. it to death, mm-hmm. no pun intended. Facts. Yeah. You know what yeah, I'm saying? He like, did. Yeah, yeah. He did. And so you speak about on that record. I remember um, touring with James Brown. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, right? we'll see. Like, yeah. W- when is it time to bow gracefully? Yeah. And how are we are we still having this conversation with ourselves as we're had into 50 and 60. Exactly, yeah. So that record's a very powerful record to me because it's just my personal, because I know James Brown's children. You know, I know James. We met James Brown numerous sister times. used to dance for him. Okay. Exactly. Your sister and he was used in to Atlanta, dance. That's right. And, yeah. she, uh-huh, and she actually produces a show for his daughter, Yama Brown. Okay. So exactly. Yeah, we know that. Yeah, we know the family. Yeah. So it's, it's a personal thing. But for me, when we did, um, what, we, we was in Japan. Japan. Yeah. We did Japan with James Brown. We've done numerous shows with, with Mr. Brown. Mm-hmm. And um, long story short, I felt like, wow, you know, I don't want to be doing this mm-hmm. at a particular age of my life. Like for me personally, I want to be able to bow out gracefully. I want to be able to um, do other things in my older age. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and this is even deeper than James Brown. For me, it's my mother. My mother's 84. And she still works every single day at her paper. I don't want to be in that situation. So for me, it's not, it's, it's a matter of um, when, do you, when do you decide to bow out? And if the industry's not, if you're not able to make real money from selling records like, like mm-hmm. you used to, when do you decide like, okay, yeah, I love creativity, but I don't have to do creative things for any kind of commercial endeavor to just stay creative. I just bow out and just do creative things on, on the side. Yeah. And I, did, I looked at James Brown as an example for me of what I did not want to do in that instance. And I love James Brown. Like, mm-hmm. he's literally one of my heroes um, musically. But, um, yeah, it's just something that I felt, you know what I'm saying? And I, that song is a... It's a telling moment for me in, in, a, in a career where I'm trying to decide even now... Mm-hmm. What do I want to do with the rest of my years? Whatever those are. It recommended a lot to me because I have the same feelings and I had yeah. the same experience with Mr. Yeah. Brown. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I, I think that I think a lot of the artists that you you still see performing like in their older ages or mature age, it's because it's just it's all they know. Yeah. yeah. And it's just yeah. like a, it gives them a sense of being and purpose. You know, and purpose because yeah. Um, I mean, if it weren't for James Brown, there would be no Prince, no Michael Jackson, no. Who I mean, also did it to I, death? You know what I'm Without saying? Without a doubt, yeah, exactly. Exactly. they went. They performed yeah. it to the very facts. You know, literally and like Speech was saying, I think it's a personal thing. Like you know, some people thrive off mm-hmm. of being in front of. He gave me that, Mr. Brown. He thrived off of being in front of people and audiences. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that was just in him. Yeah. When uh, Dave from De La Soul passed away, I, I had been filling yeah. in for him and doing certain gigs, and De La yeah. Soul is my family. But um, I was concerned about my brothers, yeah. Poss and Mace, because yeah. how do you get on the road and do those songs after your bro just passed away like that? Uh, yeah. And they got on the road immediately. Yeah, they did. Yeah. That was a concern of mine. Yeah. Because I'm like, maybe we should, maybe y'all should sit down for a second. But seeing the perform. In one of those early shows, I realized, oh, they they need this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they need it. They yeah, need exactly. this right now. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. And I mean, to me, their situation is very unique because it seemed as if, at least, his passing also coincided with them getting the rights to it all happened. of their he music. He passed away a month before they got the rights to all their yes. records, like, which means wow. he got right to the he 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 worked and he fought to the end. Yeah. yeah. And then let go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
To me, that is like the celebration of their music. To me, I would have hated if they would have decided to stop. Yeah. Like Beastie yeah. Boys stopped when MCA passed, right? Yeah. So they, I don't think they've done a tour since. They haven't since. done a tour since. For me, De La, continuing a tour with you, uh, it, it, to me, it was necessary because that music was being, in my opinion, celebrated like never before on yeah. a level mm -hmm. that they hadn't gotten for years since right. the three years, yeah. I mean, not three years, but <laughs> three feet yeah. record. Like, just on a massive level. Like, I remember seeing a, an ad, I think it was like in New York Times, I mean, not New York Times, but the, the Square in New York, like an ad for, for the, right. you know, saying for like, right. for, for their catalog. And, you, you know, this is a theme that you'll see from me. To me, that always means something when something that's so treasured on the underground and amongst the people, amongst the community, peaks and sees itself in this mainstream place. Mm -hmm. And it, yet, it didn't lose its integrity. To me, that was a moment, and I, 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 I appreciate what, they, what they're doing. I've always appreciated them. I mean, as a group that has had numerous group member changes and all types mm -hmm. of problems within our group, De La was one of those right. rare examples in hip-hop right. that just stayed steady, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And that's our connection, right? Because that's, that's, our, that's our family tree. Facts. I get to be on stage with y'all. Yeah. And doing a Grammy thing because I grew up on Dayla. Exactly. Because yeah. same for y'all. Facts. Yeah. yeah. Facts. And I mean, mm -hmm. I've always given Dayla their props, like how they've influenced me. When that Three Feet High and Rising record came out, and this is this is another belief system that I have. It gave me permission to do Mr. Wendell. That's right. Mm -hmm. It gave me permission to expand the musical, you know, samples that I was going to sample with as a producer. It gave me permission because of how much they went outside of just that narrow place. You know what I'm saying? No it, doubt. It, it has yes. to come from what you need. Like you said, they were performing because they needed that. Mm -hmm. It, you know, the thing that should make the decision for you is what you feel from the soul of it. You exactly. know, we're all yeah. creative, so we do this. You know, obviously we're blessed to do this for a living, but it can't be, because, it can't be for that. It has to That's come right. from your soul. You have to love it. So the, the decision comes when if you don't love it or if you don't feel like it's feeding something of substance within you, that's when you should stop because the audience feeds that. The audience feels that. And that's what's going to make your performance authentic. That's what's going to make the music authentic. That's right. So that's what should make the decision. That's right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And I, I want to shout out Tom Morell. Yeah. I did a great record with him. He's on your record. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Big Daddy Kane yeah. is on your record. Kane, yeah, yeah. yeah. D1 is on D1, your record. D1, yeah. Uh, yes bro. Already is the name of the song? Yep, Yes Always. Yes, yes Always, please. Yes, yes, yes Always. always yeah. Now, I want to talk about D1 for a second because sure. he's in the hip-hop news. Oh, yeah. yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Because D1 <laughs> is a brother. very spiritual brother. He's very yeah. positive and he's, yeah. he's very upfront. Yeah. <laughs> and he's going to tell you how he feels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, on this record, y'all talking about some of the stuff that he's talking about in the news. Yeah. At what point do you feel like, just how, do I, how do I word this question? For me, it's always been difficult because it's like I'm criticizing, I'm critical of other rappers. Yeah. And I'm critical of tropes. And you do have records where you talk about the trends. Literally, and yeah. All yeah, I'm critical exactly. of that. Yeah. But I always stop short of naming yeah. another artist. Yeah. Mm. And I think this is where the conflict with D1 has run into, is that yeah. he's taken it to the point where he's saying out of love, yeah. but he's naming names yeah. and is rubbing people the wrong way. Yeah. Mm. Um, at what point do you feel like, maybe speak it for yourself, but not speak because we can't speak for the brother, yeah, exactly. that, that you go from criticizing in general to yeah. maybe particularly criticizing another artist, or do you even feel like we even need to be doing that? Yeah. That's a great question. I do feel like we have the right to do it. And if people yep. feel like that's their calling and that's what they're supposed to do, then they should do that. But I, I, I do feel, I, I agree with you. For instance, I did a mini documentary called The Nigga Factory. Yeah, okay? very good piece of work. Thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Part one, two, I'm going to do three at some point in my mm -hmm. life. But <laughs> until then, what I decided to do on purpose was talk about the issues that D1 is bringing up right now mm -hmm but blurred out everybody's faces. And I took, it was painstaking for me how much effort I put into making sure that I wasn't calling out this dude or that mm -hmm. dude. Mm -hmm. So 
that is the school of thought I come from on this issue. Um, I'm going, I don't know if D1 has a personal relationship with Rick Ross, or I think maybe he called out Jim Jones or recently. Meek Mill and Jim Jones, yeah. Yeah, so Meek Mill, Jim Jones, Rick Ross. I'm not sure if he has some type of personal relationship with them and that if, if they had a conversation in that relationship where they said they weren't going to do X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. and then they did X, Y, and for, Z. For Meek, I know he had, for Meek, he had, had done some shoes mm -hmm. that said reform, and the shoes were supposed to be helpful to prison reform. Exactly. And D1 felt the way because he supported this thing, uh -huh. and then he heard lyrics on the record right, that right, he, didn't, right. he didn't think uh, matched the energy of the exactly, prison reform. Exactly. So to me, what I... What I feel on that is if he did have a, some type of personal reason that he's calling these particular guys out, then to me that's his right and it's, mm -hmm. it, is, it is what it is. Um, I will say as a Christian, though, right, that people who are not adhering to the teachings of Jesus don't have to necessarily follow those teachings or be rebuked because you're not following, following them. You get what I'm trying to say? I so, do. for instance, if someone is saying, I'm a disciple of Christ, I'm a believer in Christ, and they're not doing X, Y, Z, but they're supposed to be doing X, Y, Z, mm -hmm. another believer in Christ has the total right to say, hey, you're actually supposed to be doing X, Y, Z. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That to me is just iron sharpening iron as mm -hmm. opposed to trying to diss somebody. I think with my brother D1, who I love and I deeply respect. Same um, here. I'm proud of his willingness to do it and share it in love. And I say love in quotes. I'm going to assume that they have some type of background to where he chose this. You know, he chose mm. Rick Ross, Jim Jones, Meek Mill to speak about in this very moment. The thing I would say to him if I was having a conversation with D1 is... Also, to be careful to make sure that you're not imposing on someone else uh, 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 rules or regulations of what Christianity is about and what Jesus teaches, unless that, that person or people have agreed to follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because that's a, that's a very big part of that puzzle to me. You know what I mean? Like, right. That's, you're speaking sort of more about his issue with Lecrae. A little bit, because Lecrae is... Oh, yeah. the, Lecrae, the, 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 the Lecrae has, issue, I, I saw yeah. more clearly. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, shout yeah. out to everybody involved. I, I respect yeah. Jim too. Jones, Meek Mill, Rick Ross. I respect Lecrae. I respect D1. Facts. I love seeing the discourse. I love seeing Me us too. challenge I love that. each other. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. As long as it's done out of love. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what, though? In this culture right now, I appreciate that camaraderie and, you know, because... I feel like this generation doesn't feel like they should be held accountable for anything. Mm -hmm. So to see, you know, whichever side you fall on the mm -hmm. topic, outwardly being held accountable doesn't have to be framed as hate. I oh, agree. you're a hater yeah, that too. because I'm critical of you. It's like you're allowed to be critical. And like you said, if, you're, if it's going to be ironing, iron sharpening iron, that's going to make you better. That's going to make you want to move yep. forward in a way, whether it be in opposition or toward, you know, the other side. But yeah. you need that type of critical energy in order to move forward. And I want, it's good that this generation sees that mm -hmm. so that it's not just, oh, you're just being a hater because everything I do is just like celebrated and loved. You know what you just said that just reminded me of something that I'm closer to this issue than I even realized. I just thought about this. What? Rick Ross had a lyric back in the days, a few years ago, that was questionable. Yeah. Uh, a, a lyric that people got very upset about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I spoke publicly about it. Word up. And, okay. and I then went on Mark Lamont Hill's show and I spoke about it. Uh -huh. And I, I, I spoke about it. And when I spoke about it, I said, I don't like the lyric, but I'm not going to kick Rick Ross out of hip hop. I was like, right, piano, of course, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Where people were like, well, he's not hip hop. I'm like, well, now you're going too far. Right, exactly. Right? right. right? And so I got chastised for people said that I was supporting his lyric. Right. Mm. And then Fancy His said I was dissing him. Right. Mm. And I actually ran into the brother right. at a party and he was like, yo, why were you critical of me like this? Why, like, why did you do it in the way that you did it? Right. And we had to have that conversation. Yeah. And that conversation led to us doing a record 
called Heads Up, Eyes Open. Word up. In which right. Rick Ross kind of a little bit alludes to the conversation we had. Us challenging each other. Yeah, exactly. Made me better, made me communicate better. Facts. So I, 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 my hope is that whether or not Rick Ross and McMill agree with D1's challenge, and I'm sure they don't. Right, you know right. What I'm saying? exactly. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, the, yeah. I hope that it makes them move better. Yeah. And I know for a fact that the way in which Rick Ross is challenging D1 right now, exactly. is that, that's going to make him move better. I agree. Mm. 100% of, of agree. Of course. And it, it, if it happens mm. with love and respect, mm -hmm. because I think that's the key thing. You can be critical, but it's when you start getting disrespectful that then it's, le it's, on, it's left on deaf ears. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, thank you for your time and yeah, energy. Thank it's you, been bro. Wonderful. Thank you. It's been great. Thank I have you. one more question before we get out of here. Word up. Um, and my last question revolves around Africa. Yeah. Um, from the drum, which is just yeah. a song with drumming, yeah. to you know, uh, Africa, we thank you, which is a great song. Word up. Arrest thank Development. You. Make sure that y'all perform in Africa. And as you know, as as touring black artists, yeah. we know we can get booked in Europe, yeah. in, in in Asia, in yeah. Australia. But to get booked in Africa, yeah. we have to make, as black Americans, yeah. we have to put our best foot forward. We have to Facts. make the effort. Because of co colonization, they don't have the same resources. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They don't have the same Facts. access to us. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate y'all... Make a concerted effort. Yeah. You know, y'all go and meet with Mandela and Facts. do these mm -hmm. things. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So speak to me about the Africanness yeah. of arrested development. <laughs> well, I, I'm awesome. sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I think, you know, I remember when we did uh Zingala Maduni mm -hmm. and we did we we worked with Antoine Fuqua. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the great he, Antoine Fuqua. Yeah, he was yeah. awesome. And I think we were the first American, black American group, hip hop group to, to shoot donate in the shoot. Yeah, 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 in, yeah. In South Africa. Okay. And it was it was very important to us because um I remember we we did it on Zululand. Remember? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was beautiful to see all the people come from the village and connect with us. And in that moment, you see that we're not different. That's you right. know what I mean? It's just exactly. We're in America, they're there. And it was it was just, it was very interesting, the connection that we had. And even then, this was in, what, 94, 93, 94? 94, yeah, I think it was 94. And yeah. I remember when we did the thing with uh, Nelson Mandela through UNICEF, mm -hmm. and it was just amazing to see everybody come from their homes, and they all were singing together. And I knew then, in that moment, I think we all knew, I saw how much they needed us and how much we needed them. Yep, facts. And it was such a beautiful connection and it felt like we were really home. You know what I mean? Facts. With yeah. our sisters and brothers and cousins. And I'm looking at people and I'm like, man, that looked like so-and-so that I know exactly. back in Atlanta. Right. Right. Exactly. It was deep. It was very deep. Yeah. And just, um, I know for me, when I would uh, do the African dancing, they literally were like, can you come and teach classes? I'm like, how can I teach y'all? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right, exactly. But then right. I had to remember um, because it's, it's still different. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But I, even to this day, I can hear a drum from a mile away. And I'm like, I hear a drum somewhere and I feel it. It's their heartbeat. You know no what doubt. I mean? And so it's the connection. Like, you, you, I mean, we, you know, you can't run away from it. You know what I mean? It That's just right. fail, feels very familiar. So. It's a genetic memory. You yes, know, that's right. It's Facts. it's in us. We um to the the singing and the connection yeah. and you feeling like home. We just recently were in just left Johan there. Yeah, yeah, we're just in left Johannesburg. Johannesburg yeah. But the time previously, we had the beautiful experience. Um, Macy Gray had Macy this Gray African, gifted us with an African, with uh, an African choir. Yep, and to they, sing for us. Yeah, they sang for us. And when I tell you just broke down something. In tears. Mm -hmm. An energy mm -hmm. yes. shot through the room. Mm -hmm. I'm getting goosebumps right now mm -hmm. because their voices and the tones that they were singing in, mm -hmm. and they were speaking in native tongue, but we felt it. You, yep. you could connect with it. And so that's just speaking to how truly connected we are genetically without even really knowing it. So when we travel there, it's, it's a coming home spiritually for us yeah. and them because they're well they're welcoming welcoming us back mm -hmm. you know and, and that may not be every all the experiences <laughs> for everybody at the time right. but it's a real mm -hmm. thing that's there that we need to cultivate more yeah. yes indeed 
Yes, For indeed. me personally, I feel like, you know, piggybacking off of what y'all just said is that it's, it feels like a, a child that's maybe been adopted at an early age and, you know, they might have had incredible parents or great parents or whatever, but there's, there's also this certain point when they want to understand what their roots are. You yes. know what I mean? And yes. if they were to meet their natural mother or father, there's just this certain satisfaction that comes from that. And that's what we feel, you know, when we go back home to Africa. I call it home, too, because also from a political standpoint, I'm a Pan-Africanist, so... As am I. I. Yeah, I know you are, too. Yes, so, indeed. you know, I believe in our collective power throughout the entire diaspora, and that that's always going to be an important piece for us. And um, so, musically, that's always been part of, you know, what we want to put into the mix of, of, of what we present to the world, you know. Yeah. Well, I appreciate what y'all put in the mix so far. Is there anything that y'all want to share about the future of Arrested Development and what's next? Yeah, well, we're excited. We got um, a brand new single with um, Chuck D, Grandmaster Kaz, which mm -hmm. we're super excited about, called Hip Hop Saves Lives. And then we got a new album called Bullets in the Chamber. Actually, it's a double album called Bullets in the Chamber that's dropping in January. And, you know, super excited. Yeah, so that's that's... That's our, that's our new venture. Yeah. People's Party is proud to have the legendary Arrested Development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much.